and welcome to Concert Pipeline. I'm Steve Jones. Today on the program we have Aki Graves. Uh, I had a good interview with uh, with Shiki Graves, aka Alejandro Rose Garcia. Uh, we had a really fun chat while he was uh, at home in Austin baking. It's very hot there still. Uh, can't get away from the heat. Uh, it's pretty warm here where I am, but uh, but starting to cool down a little bit. I think. I don't know. It should be getting to winter soon, maybe. Uh, I guess we'll see what happens uh, with that. But um, I don't have a, a ton to share of, uh, up top before the interview uh, this this week, other than to stay tuned to the end of the program to uh, hear what we have coming up in the coming weeks. We have a lot of cooking and shaking, so um, we'll we'll see uh, uh, what happens with that, with all of that as it comes together. But um, let's talk about Shaky Graves for a second, and that is. Um, you know, uh, Shaky Graves has a, uh, a tour that's coming, and he's going to be coming to, uh, to Sacramento here in uh, in the Bay. Um, also, uh, a new album out September 15th called Movie of the Week. We talked about that um, as, as well, of course, um, and lots more uh, to, to talk about. What we didn't talk about is this cool clip that I'm about to show here, uh, where uh, Shaky Graves went to, um, oh, I'm so, I'm so not a tennis person, so I can't even talk about it, but the women's singles championship and, uh, Coco Goff, uh, um, was the 2023 women's singles, ch uh, champion. And she hit a couple balls into the crowd uh, that she had signed. I don't know if this is before or after, uh, and, uh, uh, Shaky Graves was at the top of the venue. I mean, like, not you know these are not close seats or anything but got a full view of the you know back and forth to the court let's say and uh and uh and coco hit this ball and it went straight to uh to shaky graves and uh, and there's great uh, instagram vid uh, video of this happening where you see it on camera go all the way up and shaky uh, catches it right away and then there's a you know another uh clip of uh shaky holding up the sign ball uh, and uh, and just super excited about it. I mean, that's cool. That's something I would like, you know, put in a uh, frame on the mount, you know, sort of thing. When I mean, I don't I don't know how often tennis players do that, where they sign balls and then hit it out. But I don't think that happens in a lot of other sports. Um, and uh, and I think that that's pretty pretty cool. So let's let's show that clip right now. She like finds you, and then boom, it's Ollie hands in the air. Uh, yeah, pretty awesome. Congrats, Shaky. That was a really cool moment. I know you're super excited. So, uh, and so that's uh, so we're gonna get into the the Shaky Graves interview. I think we're actually just gonna get right into it. Um, I have a lot going on this weekend covering the uh, Dock of Bay Festival in um, in Vallejo, uh, but and so much to cover there. That's gonna be a whole a whole separate episode or two, though. Uh, you know, that's a spoiler, I guess, a little bit towards uh, telling what's coming up on the program. But uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the show. So uh, let's go ahead and let's bring in Shaky Graves. Hey, Alejandro, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Do, do you like Alejandro? Or you like Shaky Graves? What do you? What do you yeah, Alejandro, Alejandro's great. Okay, very good. Uh, how's your day going? It's going good. It's going good. Just in my cave working on stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Is that your safe space? You you, you <laughs> habitate there, and you go there, and you're like, this is where the magic happens. Yeah, a little. Mm. And because it is burning, to... <laughs> but it's also for art too. Say say that last part again. You cut off for a second. I said it's also for art uh, as well. Yeah, yes. not just survival. Of, of course, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so tell me a little bit about, I mean, uh, you're at home right now. You're in Austin. Is that right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I want to, I want to talk to you a little bit about Austin. I think Austin's a, a great city and, uh, um, there's a, a lot of, I mean, a whole vibe there. I haven't gotten to go to any like festivals there or anything. I've always wanted to, but, uh, yeah. but the times I've, I've been there, I've enjoyed kind of the, the city, the culture. Um, I, uh, um, I have a positive memory of, uh, 
a particular burger that I had at Gordo's. Uh, I'm not oh. sure if you've you, you <laughs> oh been there. God, yeah. I, yeah, I have. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's uh, they, they have it. There's nothing better in the world than combining two of my favorite things: a burger and it's sandwiched by donuts. You got bacon in there, go, uh, go in it, and you get beer with beer with it. What more do you need? You know, so, uh, right? Exactly. This is my favorite. So, what do you, what is it about? <laughs> <laughs> what is it about Austin for you that that makes it feel like home? Um. Well, I mean, it, it really is home. You know, I've lived here for the majority of my life, but you know, for me, it's like a it's it's the people that live here my family and my friends and you know right now it 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 honestly it's like living uh i went to disney world for the first time last year actually we played like a show in florida and me and my wife and my bass player were like we're gonna go uh to disney world fuck it we're in and um it it's a super bizarre place i'm like i'm i'm really really uh constantly fascinated by theme parks in general but that one is like you know its own whole you know, like Walt Disney was trying to make the city of the future and now it's kind of like parts of it are run down and beat up you know so it's it's like but when you're in they call it being on property <laughs> like not to your face but it's like being in the bubble and we ended up meeting this girl who worked there and she was talking about how she hadn't left like the bubble or she, she was calling it property. She was like, I haven't left property. in I don't know. She said like eight months or something like six months. Oh, so no. she kind of, She's yeah, trapped. She, <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. And she was, she, she was younger and she had like moved from Minnesota and just moved directly onto Disney property. And uh, so she gets free reign within the parks and all that, but it was like the most surreal thing to talk to her about. And uh, sometimes living in Austin is a little bit like that. <laughs> it's yeah, like, yeah. You know, it's, it's a, it's a fabulous place and I, I love it, but it's like right now it's definitely in its heyday of being like a entertainment capital, you know? So it's, it's a lot of fun, which can be really, it, it can work beneficially and it can also be really exhausting where it's like any like little spot that I had is pretty blown out at this point, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's like, there's, there's no more little spots, huh? Yeah, no, there are, I mean, they, they, they they're everywhere, but, um, you know, that's kind of the pessimistic view of it. But at the same time, it's like, you know, it's been, it's been on its way there for a really long time. It, when I was little, it used to be a lot sleepier, but I think, uh, I think everything did to a certain degree. So, you know, I, I, I like knowing my, my way around the theme park. I have like my secret tunnels, you know, and I know where to like go and do certain stuff and hide out. And, and again, it's, it's really, really fun. It's like a, it's a wonderful place to live. Yeah. Do, do you go all out when everybody comes to town for like uh, Austin City Limits or uh, South by Southwest or, you know, one of those big festivals? Uh, there's, I mean, there's always something like I'm sure there is some sort of festival happening right now. Like you'll try and drive home and you're like, oh, there's a parade. I can't drive. <laughs> this is not not getting on it's like, oh, it's the kite festival or the like whatever. So, yeah, I mean. You know, it's like during South by everyone I know, like everyone who's, you know, I'm friends with tons of musicians. And so we, we all like work and, and uh, we all kind of bemoan it a little bit when it's starting where it's like, oh boy, here we go. And then, you know, halfway through you like bump into everything and you're like, yeah, all right, we're you know, you're at some, some stupid like activation for Doritos or something. And it's like, this is a pretty fun Dorito flavored cocktail that they came up with. Oh no! <laughs> you know, it's it's always yeah. just like go goofy shit like that. But um, but yeah, you know, it's like I feel really lucky to have been a, again kind of behind the scenes of a lot of that stuff. I've gotten to play ACL like three times, and usually during South by there's some sort of wild thing or someone calls. You know, you're like I'm gonna take it easy, and then someone hits you up at zero hour, and it's like Snoop Dogg and Erica Badu or in my backyard or wh whatever something absolutely you can't not go to it right and you're like yeah. oh, all right fine I'm like great this will be fun and it is lo and behold yeah yeah no that's that's cool how are you faring with the heat because you are having an unusually hot summer in austin and, uh, <laughs> it's 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 unrelenting you know yeah i mean I, I just got off the road not too long ago but it's it's kind of the same everywhere um you know it's it's really really hot outside uh but, you know, in Texas, we're unfortunately used to it. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. I have a certain level of, of, again, like I dread it. And then when I'm in the middle of it, it's like, I'm still outside doing silly, you know, I, I 
I started playing baseball on a sandlot team out here and was playing baseball in like 101 degree weather two days ago and was like, Oh, it's not 105. <laughs> I was like, okay. Okay. Psychopath. When, you're, when you're celebrating 101 degrees, you know, yeah. You know. It's, yeah, it's you're like <laughs> it's only it's only 94 degrees at, at 10 p.m. This is great. This is a huge huge opportunity for us. Yeah, winter is right around the corner. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, um, and so t- uh, you mentioned kind of getting off the road. Uh, how do you fare with tours right now? Like, I mean, I know uh, in the past sometimes you've had struggles with it being kind of too bearing and being away from home for too long, right? Yeah, I mean, well, always. Um, I mean, when I'm in it, it's like. You know, it, I've been touring for years now for, you know, I've been touring really heavily for almost 10 years. And so there's kind of a rhythm to it too. Um, you know, and there's, it's definitely been less healthy for me in the past. <laughs> like I've had much, much sketchier, uh, much more psychologically taxing tours in the past, but things have been really sweet. You know, people are coming out and we're, you know, developing all sorts of new sounds and keeping it interesting for ourselves. So I've been, I've been having a great time. Um, I mean, I definitely long for time to just do whatever, you know, cause it's always, it's always something, you know, I've been working on this album for a really long time and then touring and then presenting it and then being like, what's next. And, but, uh, you know, over all of that, I, I feel really, really blessed and excited to, to, that I get to go on tour, you know, I don't take that, any of that for granted. So it's great. It's really fun. Yeah. Is, is it fun to play new songs? Uh, also like songs that you're kind of workshopping into in kind of figuring out how you play them live and, uh, and kind of incorporating that in it's been a little while since you've had a new album, right? Yeah, no, it's definitely fun. Um, it's going to be more fun when the, in what, nine days when the album is yeah. out and people, and people will, somebody will be like, I know you're actually doing, you're doing a good job of it. You know, and you're like, thank you. We are playing the song how it's supposed to sound. Cause I mean, there's been plenty of times where I've made an album and, you know, just put so much bizarre stuff on it. And then the time comes to play the song and someone's like, play the song. And I'm like, I can't, I can't, I have no, I have no idea how to play that song. You know, like I, I didn't think about it when I was building it, but I, 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 it's just me, you know? So now I have this great, this fabulous band and we made all this music together. So we're able to do it. And we've been really working on the little details and stuff. It's really fun. Yeah. You have those songs that people still uh, call out and try to get you to play. And now, now you can actually kind of play them, you know, with, yeah. with some support, right? Uh, it works for, yeah, it works for back catalog stuff too. It's like now with the, <laughs> with, with the right personnel, with the right, you know, team behind you we can actually get some of those weird songs out of the gate too. So that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Are there places on tour that you, uh, that you're like, I just, I loved playing. I love playing there. I've got to go back there. That's, you know, it's gotta be incorporated into the tour. Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, usually it's like, (laughs) it's, you know, the things that stand out are kind of places that aren't maybe so easy to tour to that, you know, there's like random times that I've gotten to go play stuff like, we got to go play in this weird island in Canada called Tofino. That was like absolutely amazing. You have to take like a little Jurassic Park airplane into it, you know, and yeah. it's like off off the coast of uh, like west of Vancouver. And uh, yeah, it's just like an island of beautiful, nice people and amazing food. And everyone wants to like take you surfing and stuff. I was like, this is absurd, you know. And then, yeah. you know, kind of ex- extremes like that. We just where we played before um before disney world we went to we got to play in key west for the first time and that is a very very strange place so usually stuff like that playing in new york city is always just like nearly kills you with how <laughs> with how fun it is because yeah. you you know we just did we had two days there and oh my god just had such a great time i i, I love that place to death and uh yeah that's it yeah you know beach town in canada key west new york city that's those are the three cities those are the ones that's that's all we got yeah that's it and topeka kansas how was europe because you've done europe a couple times you did one solo right and then Mm -hmm. uh, incorporated the band and then kind of different experiences there yeah europe is a crazy experience um because i didn't get to go over there as much when i was sort of getting things off the ground so 
in some ways it's like the crowds are smaller and it's back to like an older grind that I used to do, which <clears throat> I don't really mind at all. I, I, some of my favorite shows that I've ever played or still get to play are like, you know, weird 500 cap rooms where everyone's kind of just smashed in there. There's a, there's a definite experience to that, um, that you lose as things get bigger. And so, you know, for better or for worse, when we go to Europe, we get to, <laughs> to get that plus a very confused, like, uh, you know, Austrian audience or something that are like, this, this doesn't sound like <laughs> the YouTube video I saw. And you're like, I know. I know. Um, but it's great. You know, it's always changed a little bit. It's like, there's been times that I've gone over there and people are just like very upset that I'm not just playing like the songs on the suitcase and stuff. And then yeah. I'll, I'll go to another place and they're like really angry that I'm not playing new stuff. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> But I thought, the, but they, 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 you wanted me to play old stuff, and they're like, "No, not here. Those we're the French. We want new stuff." I'm like, "Oh, okay." So yeah, you can't please, can't please everybody, right? So uh, uh-uh. yeah, I mean, that's the wildest part about touring Europe is you're not just going from like, you know, all the states change very, very much so. You know, as much as we think it's all, it's like it's all America. It's it's not. It's it, audiences are very different everywhere. But man, that that is taken uh, to the to a very psychedelic degree when you're going to an entire new country every day and your money suddenly doesn't, you're like, what? They're like, I thought I had pounds. And they're like, no, no, those are, those are English pounds. We need, you know, <laughs> Irish like, pounds. Different, we're like, different what? Right? <laughs> what the fuck are we talking about? Yeah. So just give me stupid, food. <laughs> yeah. Stupid American in Europe is, is a pretty fun thing to play, but yeah, there's tons of like, it, you know, I wish I had more time to sort of like actually vacation because um, it's you really have to like choose to do that because we travel so much that it seems like you're on vacation, but you're not. <laughs> you know? no. Yeah, show to show, town to town. Yeah, Mm-mm. a lot of that. Um, tell me about playing Red Rocks uh, while we're talking about shows because that's I've, I've been there once and it's it's pretty magical and I just love talking to bands about it. And, you know, and uh, your experience. I mean. You're, you're a fan of the Beatles and yeah. they played there. And uh, I mean, so many other. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think it's harder to find a band that, you know, that hasn't, that's, you know, that, that's a, that's a big enough band to a certain degree. I don't, you know, I always kind of consider it like a, um, <clears throat> you know, sort of a benchmark. There's usually shows leading up to it and then shows after it, you know? So it's like a, it's kind of a boss battle, like testing ground area, you know? So usually we work on a show that we want to like take to there. It's kind of like the, the Broadway of, you know, music venues a little bit. And people are just so excited to be there. You know, the last time, this last time we played, uh, which was not that long ago, was the day after, I don't know if you saw any of the footage of that, like Lewis Tomlinson show that happened where it hailed and a bunch of, because he's one of the dudes from what One Direction, yeah. Okay, okay. And basically, you should you should look it up. It's like a, a crazy storm came in and dumped like a foot of hail on all yeah. these unsuspecting people, and it was it was like all over the news. <laughs> we were like, yeah. we have to play there tomorrow, and yeah. so they do this. You know, since it's outdoors, they have all this crazy protocol set up that like because storms just come in off the mountains randomly. So while we were there, they had to evacuate everybody from the audience because lightning struck within a certain distance twice and the second time i was like there's no way that these people are gonna like anyone's gonna come back you know they just like evacuated like seven thousand people and everybody just went and hung out in their car and got really stoned or something (laughs) came back out and was like ready to go so i mean again it's 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 like a huge destination for people and there's it, it there's just a really unique thing about it so you know i I always look forward to it, you know, with a little bit of nerves and just a lot of excitement. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to go back to, uh, I want to kind of know a little bit about the environment in your home when you were a kid. I know you come from the line of like uh, performers. Uh, your your dad was uh, a, a set light designer and mom did a lot of stuff in plays as well. And did that kind of spawn your, your acting um, career? Like yeah. just having that in that influence? Oh yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, everybody, you know, my family all comes from, 
like extended family, all their friends and stuff were just kind of weird, starving artist, semi-successful, you know, just working artist people. So everything was kind of a viable option. You know, it was like, uh, my parents would joke and be like, just as long as you're not a lawyer, you know, or whatever. Like it was like the inverse of the American dream, kind of, but, but, but uh, most parents <laughs> are the opposite, right? You got to go be a lawyer. And then you're just telling them you're going to be yeah. the band or do the thing, you know, you're not like, no, I don't, I don't know how I feel about this. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I you know, I, it, it's also just because they grew up in very um, kind of unforgiving you know, hard households. My mom grew up in South Texas and was just like, just insanely poor and survived off of eating condiments and stuff like that. And my dad was like an Air Force brat, you know, in a nuclear family. And so they just had like rough non, you know, like be a mechanic or, you know, an alcoholic or whatever, like, you know, just get in there. And um, so when they struck out to, you know, pursue art and, um, and just kind of express themselves, you know, they, they, it meant, I could always see how much it meant to them. So again, that was kind of something that um, maybe at a certain point I kind of thought was a given or was like, yeah, this is, this, you know, I, I, it, it, looking at it from above and kind of, you know, now as an older person, it's like, it was a really important space that they held for me and, and um, really, you know, went out of their way to make sure that I was kind of raised around people like that and and with that sort of lens on the world so you know it it it's responsible for all of it yeah yeah did did you act in plays with your mom or where did you oh yeah sure yeah, yeah you did a lot of acting together oh yeah oh yeah my yeah because she was a playwright so she would always like you know for better or for worse like write she's like you'll you'll play this kid like she was a teacher at ut for a while and so if there was a, ever like a kid in a play she would just throw me into it and so i got to do do a lot of that got to hang out you know that like hung out with a lot of college kids when i was little and got taught like comic books and stuff by the people se they seemed like they were like 50 years old <laughs> and they were probably like 18 you know um but that was always just like yeah, really great. I've I've had I've had a lot of really really good uh, teachers, both like actually I guess academic teachers, but just a lot of people in life that are like, come with me, I'll show you, you know, the the back streets or whatever. Yeah, it's nice. You gotta, yeah, you gotta be careful to follow teachers when you're too young. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. Look, there's a fine line with everything. When right? they say come with me, and, you know. <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I guess I meant more like within the yeah. within within v the vision of your parent, you'll be fine. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, within the eye line. Yeah, yeah. And and how did that translate into you've been in some movies and that sort of thing, right? Like, and, and yeah. how did that kind of translate there uh, for you? Well, I, you know, I started uh, auditioning for stuff in Austin when I was, I don't even know, maybe 10 less. So I always would go out and like, you know, it was just, honestly, it was a way, it was something that I was passionate about, but it was also like a, it's a job, you know, and it was a very viable thing that I was like, if I can actually make money doing this, it would be you know, fabulous. I've been tr training to do it since I was little and being on stage for a long time. And, um, so it was, you know, and I, I really was like, I don't know, I don't know how to like work on cars. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, I was like, I was probably going to be a waiter or, you know, some sort of, uh, slacker artist person. And then I, you know, I started playing music for myself and, um, you know, I, I guess I, I knew that it would, it, it, I knew it was something that I loved so much and really kind of had my own uh, approach to. Um, but I, I didn't ever really go into it with the premise of like, you know, I got just even imagining how far it could go or what it would even look like. It's all just kind of been uh, one foot in front of the other and, and, and who knows, who knows where the end is. Yeah. And so your 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 debut album was uh, famously you did uh, very much on your own. But it, is that kind of how you you started, or did you start in like high school bands as as well, or like what did, what was that path like? Sort of, yeah. I mean, I was <laughs> I was in a I was in a, a band in high school. Um, yeah, I, I I was a co-founder of like a uh, like a 
screaming band, you know, like a whiny teenage, like a screamo band. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, and that definitely, I, I, we, we sucked, but we got to play with a lot of people that didn't suck. And so that was a big, like, crash course for me and being like you know a real snob about obscure music and um really like a a ton of really amazing people were pressing stuff on vinyl and doing all these like hand numbered diy stuff and you know screen printing their own shirts like going to goodwill and buying a bunch of really shitty t-shirts and then turning them inside out and screen printing their band's stuff on them and and it was all like you know all of that is is part of uh again, like a, a very strange sort of education into how later I would choose to put my music out. So, you know, the, the, the kind of DIY stuff that I really looked up to and admired and was a part of in high school kind of bled in later when I started to create my own music and make my own project out of it. Yeah. So tell me that, tell me about that first album, right? Uh, Roll, Roll the Bones, like t- your your process with that. Like, did you, I mean, obviously you did a lot of it yourself. Did you have a mentor through that though? Like, did you have anyone kind of that you're sharing that in your music with and you're like, Hey, but, you know, tell me, is this, is this good? What, you know, what was, what was uh, your, <laughs> no, well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I, I, you know, I always used some of my, I always used my friends, but like some of them more than others, but like my goal was always to make music that like my my more opinionated friends are the people that I always, you know, really aligned with, with musical taste that if I could sort of like fool them, like if I could make something that they maybe didn't even notice was me, then it was like, that was what I really, really wanted. And um, so I did a lot of that, you know, I like, it's a very strange thing taking it out of the bedroom into like public and, and then finding how songs don't translate during a performance or something like you might have a really cool song on your hands, but if you can't show it to anybody, it, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to get it out there. So, uh, but the recording stuff now, I just kind of like, I had a lot of people sort of help me along the way. Um, but I, you know, I wouldn't say I did anything like right per se, but I just started recording all the time. Um, so there's a lot of like, absolute misses and things I did wrong, but I figured out how to record on a Tascam four track and then um, bounce it into a, just a really terrible computer I had that would crash all the time. So, but I had had some, like my mom's friend gave me a, a bootleg, like, you know, pirated copy of what was, it was called cool edit pro, which, which now I think is a, uh, what's the Adobe music software? It was like an Adobe, Adobe product from back in the day. Right. It was like, yeah. now it's logic and or whatever. Like what pro, pro, yeah. Pro tools sort of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and so, um, and so you would, you would produce it yourself. And then at what point kind of did you in, uh, start incorporating pro tools and kind of building upon those, you know, those skills? What was that? Well, that was, like, so, so then I, yeah, I put that record out in like 2011. Um, and it, it was kind of a, the top of my, the previous like five years of recording, you know, every time that I would like make a song I was really proud of, I would sort of swap a lesser song out on my like main album I would give to people. Um, and then in like 2012 or 13, I kind of was like, I'm going to set out and make an actual record the way you're sort of supposed to do it. And also my computer exploded and the, my four track broke and I didn't really have any way. I couldn't really figure out how to like make the songs I wanted to make. And then, uh, yeah, I met this guy named Chris Busada and he and I, he was living in New York at the time and he and I just hit it off and I went and started recording music with him. And then not too long after that, he moved to Austin. He had lived here before. And he moved pretty close to my house and we just became like best friends and producer buddies. And he would come over and he had like, you know, a nice laptop and all this like production gear and stuff. And so we, we ended up building my second album together and also did it in my house, but it felt like a, you know, five times as fancy. And uh, yeah. yeah, that was the next stage of that was fully digital, you know? And, and that's where you built the big old diorama, right? Like uh, this is a four, four, four thing for your album 
cover? That was uh, no, that was the next oh. one. That was the next okay. one we did. That was 2018. Okay. That was Can't Wake Up. Mm, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I built like that, a multi plane kind of based off again Disney stuff, like the multi plane camera thing. I I built all these slides and shot a photograph through it. It's pretty impressive. Uh, you know, yeah, it was fun. I wish I had and, filmed the, I like recorded the process more because <laughs> now I'm like, like a, if you'd had time lapse, you know, and you kind of, yeah, <laughs> it was those. fun. It was really fun to make. Yeah. No, that's really cool. And and then, so then around that 2014 time, you got the opportunity to go on Conan and Letterman mm -hmm. uh, at that same time. Like, tell, tell me about that. Like I'm a big Conan fan. Uh, yeah. Actually, I, uh, I have one of these on my stuff here. So, uh, oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, but uh, what, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, I mean, same. You know, I first time I got a like for, when I first had like a TV in my room, um, I would watch Conan kind of religiously every night. That was like the my my last thing I do before I go to bed. Um, so yeah, I grew up with that. And then, you know, I've grew up with Letterman my whole life and, uh, getting to do both of those was like, you know, I got in on the last year that Letterman was there and, uh, it was just, yeah, it was pretty mind bending and it, and very, very validating. It felt really nice. And, um, yeah, I loved it. I mean, that was a, you know, you, you, you don't really get to spend a lot of time basking in that moment. It happens really, really fast. And, uh, so I tried my best to like soak it all up, but yeah, it was a treat. It was really cool. Did you find doors opening because of those, those sort of opportunities, like playing bigger venues and yeah, uh, and that sort of thing? Yeah. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Um, yeah, and it's just like you know, it it it's just definitely one of those things where it just sounds. It also really sounds nice. Like you don't have to watch it. We're like, ah, oh, I went on David Letterman. And people are like, oh, cool, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> It's on the resume. Then, it's on the Wikipedia. It's, on, right? so, it's <laughs> true. It's it's on there. Yeah, it, it absolutely and it lives on the internet forever. So, but yeah, it's I mean it's pretty pretty harrowing experience too, where they're like three, two, one, go. You're on pre-recorded television, mm -hmm. but it was really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell tell me, if, and we'll get to the album here in just a minute. The new album. But tell me about uh, getting your own day, February 9th. Uh, like. What is that? What was that experience like for you? Uh, and uh, and and I know you try you do something really special every February night too, and you put all your music up for pay what you want for it sort of thing, and yeah. and unre unreleased stuff too. So like, t tell me about that experience. Yeah, that was um, that was like one of the very first you know things that meant a, that was like a big accolade. The city of Austin, you know, not to diminish it that much, but like they give out my day has already been taken by I think it was like Drew Brees Day or someone. I'm, I'm sure it's like four other people's day now. There's only so many days a year, <laughs> but it, it technically Shaky Graves Day was um, February 9th, 2012. So that was like a year after my first album came out. And, you know, you basically you went to City Hall and like interrupted a meeting and played a song and they gave me a little piece of paper and I was jazzed, you know, and I went and played laser tag with my friends. And then, uh, yeah. And then every year I've just used it as like, again, kind of a, a moment to clean house a little bit or check in with where I am every year. So I go through and like, yeah, release stuff that I've been working on or, you know, kind of use it to just like clear it out and check back in. And, you know, I always try and give back to like a charitable cause and, and, uh, you know, use it as a, as a, a day of real gratitude. It's like my alter ego's birthday. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, well, let's talk about the new album, right? So um, it comes out the 15th, like it, like you mentioned, uh, movie oh, yeah. of the week. And it, and it wasn't intended as a normal, like you're putting out an album. Like you you went into this project um, making music for a friend's movie, right? Yeah. And, and tell me, tell me what happened there. Like it kind of fell apart at one point. Um, sort of. Yeah. I mean, it, it was kind of while everything was falling apart, honestly, it was during, it was kind of mid pandemic. Um, it was in 2020. So, you know, at that point, me and Chris Busada, who I had mentioned, um, 
who, you know, later became my drummer and co-producer throughout a bunch of stuff. Him and I finally parted ways right around 2020 and everything was kind of up in the air and, you know, including like the world. <laughs> so I was like, I don't fucking know what's going on. And um, yeah, I started making music for a friend's film and, and it was just like a really fun experience to try and uh, instead of thinking about like, what do I want to write today? You know, like I can write a song about anything. It was like looking at footage and then trying to match, you know, specific emotions and moments. And it's just like a fun exercise. Um, and so through that, I made a bunch of stuff and, you know, I thought I was doing like a stellar job of making scenes more stressful and stuff like that. And then the director was like, Oh, that's, that, I don't want any of that. I was like, what? <laughs> so, so I made a bunch of material and found like, had like a nice Renaissance about it. And then the director and I didn't see exactly eye to eye, but it was his movie. So, you know, like <laughs> what, uh, what, you know, he didn't ask me to do half that stuff. So I, I had a bunch of cool like themes and again, just sort of that new, um, mentality about how i wanted to approach making an album so i called like five of the my favorite people that play music that you know i, I think are are just people of a like like-minded heart too like really just like good friends and brilliant musicians and we decided to go in and start making this sort of um borderless music project where it was like we approached making the songs like I, I had demos for some, but it was really like us trying to make songs about moments, you know, where we're like, okay, this will be like the bad guys theme or like, let's imagine that this is like a leaving town version. Um, and then we'd be like, Ooh, let's play this. And like, this is like a, a Calypso version of that. This is like a beach scene or whatever. And so we made all of these different versions of every song. And we also recorded the session where we would go in and like all the mics in a room would be running for 10 hours a day. And so everything was caught just us like just jibber jabbering and, and uh, a lot of just fucking around and jamming and people swapping instruments and doing stuff. And then I, I basically, I went through it and for like two years had been just having to go through and edit it like a, like a movie really like going through all the footage, you know, and I ended up finding, you know, hundreds of songs at this point. Um, so the ones we're, we're, we're lovingly calling the actual album, the director's cut right now, because there's so many other versions of it. And, uh, and we're doing this thing that I, I just actually looked at it. It's for the website, um, for movie of the week. I came up with this because there's so many different versions of each song and some yeah. of them I just loved so much, but they wouldn't, they didn't fit with some of the other stuff. And, and, um, I ended up finally choosing, you know, the 13 songs that are going to, that are on the, the main album that's coming out. But then all the other ones, I was like, these are just too much fun. So I basically designed with this web team a feature on my website where you can go, like when you get my album, there's a QR code on the album that's like hidden in the TVs. And if you click on it, it'll take you to a website where you can um, generate your own albums out of this big pit of music and so since it's movie of the week the whole idea is that you can like make your own movie so i've made i think i'm up to like 500 but yeah, i'm gonna probably get up to like 800 different album covers and then like a thousand different movie titles that i that i built and used like ai to help me expand on and then like edited through them and took out all the stuff i didn't like and and uh, so what it does is it'll give you a blank area that you can type in what what genre of movie you want, and it'll scramble all that stuff, and then it'll give you a synopsis of your specific movie, and then it'll give you a soundtrack to it that it pulls from all those songs, and you can just endlessly generate albums out of it. That's so cool. It, it kind of reminds me of this thing that uh, I think Francis Ford Coppola was trying to do like eight or ten years ago or something, where he's he was like live edit uh, live directing a movie or live editing a movie in front of an audience or something crazy yeah i know i know i'm like okay i, I don't know that his you know uh, worked out but having a spot where people can go uh on your on your site and kind of control it themselves i mean that that seems pretty cool so yeah and it's like i've been trying to kind of <clears throat> you know the the question with also like releasing all the b-sides and stuff like that is like you know, in modern times, like, how do you, uh, how do you ask someone to like 
continuously purchase an album or something, you know, because I, I also use Spotify and, you know, online resources just like a ton, you know, I, I yeah. was a little bit more of a hardliner about it in the past, but again, I think most people have caved to convenience and, and with stuff like, you know, music software, it's like, it's, it's heartbreaking that the industry wasn't, isn't what it was, but it's honestly not like a, a it's not, you know, it's not from like the middle ages. It's still a, a ever changing, you know, I'm glad it's not the 1950s music industry, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's not always great. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm still pretty staunch about like, you know, I came to age in the time of, Napster and LimeWire and full piracy and like believe very much in that and have always wanted to find a way again with like the DIY stuff that I grew up with too is like I would rather someone have it and listen to it and care about it and engage with me in a certain way than forcibly try and sell shit to people. Um, so I'm always yeah. kind of trying to find a way to go around this and also not like piss my record label <laughs> off or like, you know, go broke myself or anything like that. But this is sort of a unique way that I've come up with that if someone really wants to, you can, you could buy an album every day for a month and you would never get the same thing. Yeah. That's, that's so cool. That's so cool. And, and you mentioned a, you kind of incorporating AI a, a bit. Where do you land with uh, AI and kind of its, its involvement? Where's, where's it going to well, go for mu music too? Like, I mean, that's really, I, you know, that, that is kind of the question, um, you know, cause part of it was like, I, I don't, I don't see it being possible that like, you know, if I was evil Netflix or whatever, I, you know, it's like, you just deep fake movies for forever and ever, you know what I mean? Like, I, I totally understand. And also as a consumer, it's like, it, it does sound very interesting to me to be like, um, I want a movie with Jean-Claude Van Damme starring as a Mrs. Doubtfire style character directed by Francis Ford Coppola uh, that lasts 33 minutes and has four fights in it or whatever, you know? And like, yeah. I think that's, I, I think that's awesome. And I think that that is somewhat inevitable to a certain degree, but at the same time, I think the human, human component of all this is that like, I think people in general really hate, and are, are kind of overwhelmed with the concept of making decisions all the time. <laughs> like, you know, there's, there is a mindless droning thing about like classic television. That's very comforting in an awful way that now with like streaming services where you, I feel like I've seen every movie on earth now. And that yeah. sometimes I'm like, Oh, shitty TV. You know, it's like, <laughs> it just plays stuff or like the radio, like, wow, the radio is so cool. But, you know, I think that, there's always sort of a cyclical nature of stuff and vinyl comes back and this comes back. And, and honestly, like half the software that I use now with my big editing rig for music and stuff uses some form of AI anyway. It's, it's just kind of what predictive software has been using for a long time to analyze, you know, EQs and stuff like that. And, you know, I think there's a lot of like hot buzzwords about it. And I, I also think it's a totally, ever moving target that people should stay diligent about, you know, with the premise of jobs being taken, but some jobs like working in the coal mines or whatever, it's like, I'm whatever, like, you know, I don't know at what point we're going to actually want to really be futuristic or we just kind of want to pause it about it. But n no matter what, like I, I make music for myself and I can't really see it and a lot of the people I know, it's like, I can't really see if, if AI was just generating, you know, like virtual musicians and stuff, I don't think anyone I know would just be like, well, got to pack it up. Cause like, you know, pop music already feels very robotic and, <laughs> you know, right. yeah. so I, I think it's an important thing. And, and again, I, I can't speak for every industry and I think we're going to see a lot of really bizarre things pop up and, you know, writers are really in peril and like, there's some really wild shit that's going to shift around. But, um, I just hope that the, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know, and can figure out how to use it as a tool. And I think it's just an ongoing conversation and really it hasn't, you know, it, at this point, it's like, 
it, it's been really helpful for me to create an effective art project out of, but I still have to do a ton of like administrative stuff about it. And, you know, but it has helped me create something that will have an effect on a listener in a way that I, I couldn't have just done on my own uh, right. to the same scope. So I think there's some merit there and I'm sure I will get asked that question a few more times in the following. Right. I'm, I'm not the last one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yeah. No, uh, it's, I guess you got to embrace it, right? I've, I'm trying to be hesitant, you know, I'm hesitant about it. Like I just, you know, I try not to live life. I don't know. I know it's there and it's going to take over everything, but I'm a little reserved with well, it, you know? So, but. I mean, yeah, I, I get, you know, it's, it, there's still a lot of, <laughs> still a lot of decisions that each one of us gets to make about how much we, you know, whatever plug in or not. Um, at least at this point, it can get a lot weirder, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it can. Uh, yeah. Well, well, uh, as we wind up, you have this tour coming up as well. Uh, it's a pretty expensive tour for the next couple months. And, um, and tell me, what does that look like uh, for you? I know you're I'm not here on the West Coast, so you're going to hit Northern California and Sac Sacramento, which Jesus phase is a good place to play. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's going to be, you know, it's kind of going into the end of my year a little bit. At least that's how I see it. Um, this is kind of the last time I'm going to have a few consecutive weeks at home with nothing really to do. And I still have a lot to do. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's going to be a strong end of the year. You know, it's been a minute since I put an album out. So it's going to be really fun to do that again, to kind of push push new music out there. and And, and again, it's... Yeah, it's it's a lot. It's you know, it's hard to I, I try and kind of leave it on the court, so to speak, sometimes where it's like it's all pretty overwhelming if I look at it from from a really long distance, but you know, it's like gonna savor it. It'd be nice. That's the best thing to do, so I like it. Yeah. Well Andre, thank you for taking the time today. I appreciate it. Uh hopefully the the weather cools down a little bit for the, the last couple of weeks, but definitely you know, we can't can only hold out hopes, right? So, <laughs> no. no, no, I've given in. Yeah, give it in. Okay, give it in. Well, there's cooler places you'll you'll get to. So that that's the silver lining, right? So, absolutely. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, congratulations on the new album, um, and the, and it's coming out here in uh, in about a week. And um, and good luck on the tour ahead. Thanks, man. I appreciate yeah. it. It was nice talking to you. Nice talking to you as well. You have a great rest of your day. Okay. Yeah. You too, buddy. That was my interview with Shaky Graves here on Concert Pipeline. And that takes us to the final segment on the program, uh, the music news. All right, a couple stories to wind out the program here. First off, of course, is Jamie Buffett. Uh, I'm sure everybody has heard about this uh, by now, but uh, Jimmy Buffett uh, passed away this week. Um, he's going to keep the party going with a final album, though, uh, Equal Strain on All Parts. The posthumous set uh, It's scheduled to arrive later this fall and features collaborations between uh, Jimmy Buffett and Paul McCartney, among other friends. Um, a lot of people are mourning the loss of Jimmy Buffett, and of course, social media blew up with everybody in the their pictures with Jimmy Buffett and how, talking about how they, uh, how he impacted them, how nice, how great and amazing he was as a person, uh, and uh, and so it's it's pretty sad. He's one of those presences uh, that you don't expect to lose, really, right? I didn't I didn't know he was even near near the end, um, and uh, he's going to give one last gift of a new album. Uh, he'd uh, signed to Sun Records before his death on September 1st. Uh, he's going to have his final al album, Equal Strain, on all parts. It's going to be released later this year on November 3rd. Yeah, uh, they should have released it right around, you know, his, his passing. I mean, that's just my take. I thought it was so amazing when uh, David Bowie released Black Star a couple of days before he died. It just felt like it went hand in hand and it was this closing of a chapter and you know i don't know if the uh, jimmy buffett's album isn't done or uh what the deal is with that but um if it is i should have just rolled it out early and just as a celebration of his his life and uh and hard work um 
It was recorded this year, co-produced by Coral Reavers, Michael Utley, and Mac Manatley. Uh, it contains 14 tracks and includes features from Emmylou Harris, uh, Lenny uh, Gallant, uh, Angelique uh, Kijo, the Preservation Hall Jazz Band, and Paul McCartney. Uh, Paul McCartney uh, remarked on the album's tracks, Bubbles Up, and uh, My Gummy Just Kicked In. Uh, <laughs> I love that Jimmy has a, a song called My Gummy Just Kicked In. Uh, those are both released on Friday, September 8th. Uh, so just after uh, Jimmy's passing, they did put those out. And uh, in his uh, September 2nd tribute to Jimmy Buffett. He says, uh, I was very happy to have played on uh, one of his light latest songs called My Gummy Just Kicked In. We had a real fun session and he played me some of his new songs. One in particular I loved uh, was the song Bubbles Up and I told him that not only was the song great, but the vocals were probably the best I've heard him sing ever. That's really great. Uh, he said he turned a diving uh, phase a phrase that is uh, used to train people underwater into a metaphor for life when you're confused and don't know where you are to just follow the bubbles they'll take you up to the surface and straighten you out right away um third single from the album like my dog was also released on friday uh so uh it, it, Jimmy's daughter, Sarah uh, Delaney Buffett, uh, took to Instagram with a tributing message to her father where she wrote to him, I will love you forever and I will always keep the party going responsibly, of course. Uh, but uh, when in Margaritaville, you've got to celebrate, right? So, um, yeah, great stuff. I remember listening to Jimmy Buffett a bit as a kid. It was one of the artists that my dad listened to. Uh, and... Uh, and it just, it was just as calm, you know, relaxing, after, you know, wasting away again. It's just nice. It's just good upbeat music that you can just enjoy, right? Uh, and so you can check out those songs online. Um, thoughts go out to Jimmy's family and friends, of course, uh, you know, um, on his, his passing. Okay. Uh, Brian May and Roger Taylor announced the lineup and tour dates for official tribute band Queen Extravaganza. Uh, so this is a uh, run of tour dates that's happening next year. Uh, they've been touring, Queen Extravaganza has been touring together for over a decade, and the lineup was handpicked by May and Taylor to perform their music. Uh, uh, May and Taylor have now confirmed the lineup for next year's tour it includes uh, Nick Radcliffe on guitar, Francois Oliver, uh, Diane on bass, George Farrar uh, on drums, and Ali Arrero, uh, Neto, and uh, Garrett Taylor on vocals. So um they make this lineup they're not in the band they just made it and send them on their way i guess to play queen songs uh another queen tribute band there's dates in Feb february and march none of them here in the united states uh more so in uh like yeah, london stockton manchester over in uh europe um that sort of thing. So if you want to see that, you can go get tickets. But meanwhile, another Queen News, an auction took place earlier this week that saw over 1,400 of Freddie Mercury's personal possessions uh, sold off. And uh, uh, Brian May w uh, was too sad to think about th uh, this. They, I know they sold handwritten lyrics for some of Queen's most famous songs, jewelry worn by Mercury and his collection of artwork, go under the hammer, including like the piano, uh, the Mercury used to compose his hit song, Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, it was a 1973 Yamaha Grand sold for 1.7 million pounds. And that's a, surpassed the amount that John Lennon's piano, which he used to write Imagine, reached in a previous auction. Uh, and uh, May shared a photo of uh, Mercury um, on the guitar, uh, you know, ahead of the auction. So. He's just, uh, it gives you weird feelings to see that stuff go because you don't know whose hands it's going into, where it's going, right? I mean, but these are songs that will live forever. And this is just a piece of that history. And uh, and to see it kind of go away, it's it's a hard thing, right? But no, I guess the money goes to a good, good cause. Um, so he said, Freddie's most intimate personal effects and writings that were part of what we shared for so many years will go under the hammer and be knocked down to the highest bidder and disappear forever. I can't look to us, his closest friends and family. It's too sad. Uh, so it's a, it's a sad time for him. All right. Ozzy Osbourne is heartbroken. Uh, he can't perform at Power Trip Festival. 
this is a festival down in uh, Southern California in Indio where Coachella takes place. Uh, it's in October. Headliners Metallica, ACDC, and Guns N' Roses are playing. I don't know how ACDC is playing uh, with Brian, if Brian Johnson is playing, if that's what that means, uh, because he's lost most of his hearing. Uh, and Malcolm Young is no longer with us, right, I believe. So <laughs> uh, So I don't know how ACDC is playing, but they're, they're built. And, uh, and I guess uh, Ozzy was supposed to play as well. I mean, kind of filling out that top lineup. But a statement shared by... Uh, him explained in July that he was not ready to perform due to his health issues. He said, unfortunately, my body is telling me that I'm just not ready yet, and I'm much too proud uh, to have the first show that I do in nearly five years be asked. He wrote in a statement, uh, Sharon and Kelly Osborne have revealed that he struggled with the decision, decision ever since. We can't talk about it in the house because it's just too heartbreaking to see that all he wants is just one more show, Sharon said uh, to Rolling Stone. Uh, she's, she also said, and Ozzy wants to be on that show with all his friends. It's heartbreaking for him to see everybody going on and he's just left behind. And Kelly said, he could do it right now if he sat in the chair. Uh, he uh, said that if he can't give his fans what they paid to see, he won't do it. And so Judas Priest are scheduled to take Ozzy's place at Power Trip on Saturday, October 7th. Uh, so uh, that's, that's too bad. I know, I know he's just kind of seeing that lineup and knowing it's a once in a lifetime lineup and he would be a part of and he just can't do it. So hopefully he gets better soon. Fall Out Boy have announced a 2024 U.S. tour with Jimmy Eat World. Uh, so uh, they shared a teaser video in which they contemplate who they should take with them on the second leg of their So Much For Tour Dust uh, tour before they eventually settled on Jimmy Eat World. Uh, you can watch that teaser uh, online, of course. There's uh, a number of dates, and this time the Bay Area is represented. So they're going to be playing March 3rd in Sacramento at Golden One Center. Uh, that is our Northern California show with Jimmy World, the main uh, hot mulligan, uh, and other bands on select dates. Um, so that is the Jimmy Eat World news. Um, all right. Uh, Blink-182 uh, continue to tease new music with a cryptic clock. Okay, uh, they uh, feature, they, they st uh, started teasing in new music with the mystery website and a series of posters earlier this week. Now they've shared a cryptic digital clock, which flashes the time 12 o'clock and switches between a.m. and p.m. Uh, on their social media channels. It also plays the same snippet of music that first appeared in their website earlier. Um, and it, it contains a Blink-182 logo as well as the phrase, one more time, could be the title of the new album or single it's, uh, unknown yet at this point. Uh, and according to the Blink-182 Italia fan account on X, the artist formerly known as Twitter, uh, the posters will feature uh, what appear to be song, uh, also feature what appear to be song lyrics. Do I have to die to hear you miss me? Do I have to die to hear you say goodbye? I don't want to act like there's tomorrow. Uh, I don't want to wait for this one more time. So they, uh, of course, remarked the return of Tom DeLong last year by releasing the single Edging and confirmed that their ninth studio album was in the works. Uh, we saw Blink-182 on their last tour where they hit Sacramento. Uh, very spur of the moment, decided to go, and it was a really great show. I do not regret going. I'm so glad I got to see it. Uh, it's great to see the uh, Blink-182 trio together as a, a whole once again. So, so very, very cool. Uh, that is our music news for today. No, uh, no breaking Foo Fighters news this week that I uh, I see, uh, but um, but some good stories uh, out in the music world nonetheless. Um, all right, so uh, let's talk about what's coming up in the coming weeks on Concert Pipeline. Currently in the middle of covering uh, the Mare Island Dock of Bay Festival in Vallejo. That is uh, happening as of the time of this airing. That happened this past weekend. And uh, a bunch of great bands played, played that. Uh, on Saturday, I had a chance to cover Average White Band, Confunk Shun, uh, and Morris Day in the Time. Morris Day in the Time, I tell you, they were great. I don't want to give too much away because we'll get into that uh, you know, in the next episode. But man, they got it. They delivered. Uh, and... Uh, and man, what a crowd, I tell you, at that, at that show. So uh, a lot of fun. And then um, Sunday, day two, 
uh, was, uh, you know, a bunch of other um, soul and uh, funk bands, but with California Honey Drops headlining, they've been on the program a couple of times, uh, and Fantastic Negrito, I saw Fantastic Negrito at Bottle Rock last year, I believe, um, right before I moved, and uh, uh, put on a good show. So looking forward to that as well as other artists to play. So we might break that into two episodes, one for day one, one for day two, uh, sharing some songs from the show uh, and pictures and all of that. Uh, and then uh, didn't do any interviews for this one. This is just music and coverage. Uh, and then uh, and then big news as of right now, I have booked an interview with uh, with. Uh, Oh my gosh! Wow, uh, Michael C. Hall and his uh, and his band. Um, uh, he, oh my gosh! I'm having such a brain fart. Why? Uh, I'm, I have an interview booked with Princess Goes, um, uh, and it, you, the, uh, formerly known as Princess Goes to the Butterfly Museum. It's Michael C. Hall from Dexter and Six Feet Under fame. Um, is so I'm going to get to talk to him this this week as well, and that's lined up as of uh, now. It hasn't been recorded, so I don't want to say too much about that. Um, I'm hoping to go to Frank Turner when he's here in Sacramento in a week. Could maybe interview. I don't know. We'll see. I don't. I don't know if that's going to happen or not. But it's something I'd like to do, uh, and uh, uh, and so that would be really cool. That's all I got for today. Good stuff coming up. Some good shows around the corner. So uh, that is our show. For all of us here at Concert Pipeline, I'm Steve Jones. We'll catch you next time.